We recognize it, Lord. There's a people, Lord, now in Van Leer who are giving recognition to you on your throne and saying that you are worthy to be magnified. You are worthy to be exalted. You are worthy to be sought. Lord, we look to you. And as the psalmist says, they looked to him and they were radiant. That which is of you, on you, from you, Lord, comes down and changes us as we gaze upon your beauty and your splendor. That which we are is changed, Lord, into that which is like you. And we bless you for that, Lord, exchange of life. That beholding of you, Spirit of God. Glory to glory to glory, not our own, because no flesh shall glory in your sight. But the glory of God, the person of Jesus Christ and the life therein. Lord, help us to bless you at all times. At all times. We were talking about today, bring us into that continual Christ reigning relationship. Not seasonal. All the time. Lord, I thank you that you are coming quickly. You are making a bride ready. And you aim to come quickly. The Lord is coming for his people that he has made for himself. Isn't that beautiful, brothers and sisters? He's making a people for himself. He aims to come and marry that vessel, the wedding supper of the Lamb. We're all invited. Help me to be ready, Lord. Every test, every trial that you allow, help it to produce what you aim for it to produce, conformity in your image. Trust in you like I've never trusted you before in all things at all times. Lord, you aim to deliver us out of this current bondage. Not just us. Creation. That which it has been subjected to, you aim to deliver it by the revealing of the sons of God. Bless you. Bless you, Lord. Do it in our time. Do it in our generation. I ask for that spirit of God. That's a prayer, it's an appeal, and it's also, I believe, what you want us to pray. Do it in our generation. I ask that it would not pass to another generation. I ask that it would not be delayed. I ask that you would awaken your people now. Awaken. Awaken. May those who sleep be awakened. May Christ arise. Let us be sober in spirit. Let us gird our minds for action. That's what Peter says about it. Lord, the battle's on. You aim to be the victor. <laughs> all, uh, I'm going to start preaching, but all this Christian stuff, Lord, cannot secure this victory. You alone can secure this victory in the hearts of your people, in your body. Lord, do it in us, in me. Do it in us, in me, I pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. What a time to be alive, brothers and sisters. Not business as usual. It's not. God doesn't aim for it to be. I ask for sobriety, Holy Spirit. Continual sobriety to me, to us. To see with God's eyes the time in which we live and who you aim to be within this time.
Andy was telling me uh, before, and he could probably explain it better than I could, but he was just talking about how the Lord was speaking to him. One of the reasons he prayed it this morning about vision was the, the far-sighted, the near-sighted blindness. You can be both, either or. And how the Lord was just telling you that both are a measure of blindness, whether we're seeing what's ha happening and coming in the future clearly, but missing what the Lord wants to be now and vice versa. The Lord wants 2020 vision. Isn't that right, Andy? That's what he's telling Andy, and I, I completely agree. That resonates so much in my spirit, and so much of what my message and what we're talking about. Lord, help us now today. For far too long, the church has pushed off what is meant to be today because readiness starts now at whatever time it is, 7.05, July 15th, 2023. Readiness is meant to continue today. Not three years from now, not five years from now, not ten years from now. Today, the church has had a really bad habit, and I have a sneaky suspicion that Satan has aided that, pushing it off, pushing it off, waiting, waiting for something coming, something coming when the Lord is on the scene inwardly to make us ready for Him. So we have delay and delay and delay. God, let the delay be over, I pray. In Jesus' name. And help me to quit delaying the beginning of the message. <laughs> <laughs> by preaching a free message. Lord, we love you. We bless you. Have your way tonight, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm just in a, I've been in a really relaxed mood when I've been up here. Maybe too relaxed. I might need a little correction. A little too much. Uh, praise God. Those who are going to receive the offering, you guys go ahead and come. Thank you for everyone who gives. Um, I don't think I've... We've said this, but um, if there are people online who are giving, you can give via the website. Um, and uh, thank you guys for that, for those who, who do give. And if you want to write a check, Messengers of Shiloh Church, you can make your checks out to that. Well, Dad, you ready? Thank you. thought he'd at least pray for me, but... <laughs> After what he said this morning, I need it. <laughs> I wanted to do an advertisement that I never do, but uh, Mark Staub uh, made me this. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, obviously, it's not to hold money. I don't have any. You know? <laughs> uh, now, for my Bible and, and um, paraphernalia <laughs> that goes with my Bible. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, he had made Donna a uh, purse, right, as well. And um, so thank you, Mark. What craftsmanship. Yeah, I know you can't see it well from there, but it uh, has a dove on the top of it here. And uh, anyway, very, very nice, huh? Just want to show it to you and make you envious. No, no. <laughs> if you need something like this or whatever, Mark can do it. So that's an advertisement, huh? Mark didn't ask me to do that either, did you, brother? Not at all. He wouldn't do that. Uh, Nikki did, but not. <laughs> Nikki didn't either, did you, Nikki? <laughs> well, amen. The Lord is uh, always magnificent. Is he not? So I really wasn't in a rush to get up here and share. Um, but, uh, I mean, I will. It's just that I'm not necessarily in a rush to do it. So, you know, there's times when it's not appropriate to say things um, uh, as some necessarily. There's a lot of things that the Lord is doing, and sometimes he wants that made visible in, in a meeting like this or other meetings or privately and... and uh, and wisdom is to always ask him, does he want that told or shared or uh, not presume upon him? And just because I can see something doesn't mean I'm to say anything about it. Um, and that's a trust issue, right, with the Lord? Hello? You know, the Lord um, is able to trust more if I know how to be silent that actually builds more trust than actually saying something. 
Both are important. Don't misunderstand me. But So um, there's something I do want to share. I'm, I, I know that I'm supposed to share um, before I go back into the book of Hebrews. So Josiah, without knowing any of it, because it was happening again up here while we were in our time. But it deals with uh, um, Genesis chapter 11, uh, Luke chapter 19, and then our time. And so the good, it's an encouragement uh, for God's people, what I'm about to say, please hear that, God's people listening online, we who are here together. So I became aware of, uh, of this watchman angel standing in our midst who I've never met, never seen before. There's angels assigned to me who knew him, and they were greeting him. Um, but this angel had been with the Lord in Genesis 11 when he came down to see what was going on in the building of the Tower of Babel before he would bring judgment. This angel was with him. The angel actually um, had an hourglass and the sands of time were reaching a now moment in which God was going to stop what was happening at the Tower of Babel. The same angel was with the Lord in Luke chapter 19. Notice from the city that's around Babel, it actually says that to the city of Jerusalem in Luke chapter 19. When the Lord approached the city of Jerusalem, wept over it, had you only known the hour of your visitation. Right? Isn't that what he said? Had you only known. Because they didn't know, then judgment would follow. Sands of time, that angel directly involved in the judgment that would culminate in AD 70. It began before that. And now here he is again in our time. And the Lord had come down among us to see those whose hearts are made perfect toward him. Jesus said it well, well, will I find faith on the earth? Didn't he? Well, there's the positive to that he did find here amongst us. Those that have and are coming out to the Lord out of the city that was meant to be set on a hill. I'm speaking to the church. But like Jerusalem, in the same spirit of Babylon that was in Jerusalem is now in the church. In the sands of time, Sam, have come to a divine moment. It is inevitable what's about to follow, as certainly as you can read Genesis 11 and Luke 19. That angel is proof. That watchman angel is proof. He's been with the Lord each of those times. More than that, but each of those times, biblically speaking. That is, just I was saying, it's the time in which we live, right? The time in which we live. Second Thessalonians, Paul's um, speaking directly about time. The people of God were not to be confused about something already happening. Isn't that right, Sam? As though something had already happened when it had not happened yet. And it was not going to happen till a certain time. Paul makes that clear. The uh, great apostasy, the, listen to this, the revealing. I mean, I've read that so many times, but it was different what was just said to me. This revealing, isn't that right, Melanie? 
this revealing of the man of sin. It's prophesied right in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He will be revealed. He already is being, is he not, Melanie? Melanie told me back some months ago, okay, if I say this, I mean, I've already started. She saw the face as I did. I saw it in 2001, December, the face of the man who would be the Antichrist, the man of sin. Melanie was shown the face. I don't know when, but you were shown the face. There's other people. This isn't uh, Chris Reed, friend of mine. It is the time in which we live. He is being revealed. The man of sin has been and is being revealed. He will be fully revealed, right, Eugene? It has begun, and there's no stopping this. I don't know the exactness of the time. I just know that it has begun, and we are in it. We're not going to be. We are. That angel, stunningly so to me, is proof of the time. He had the hourglass in his hand. Judgment upon the nations, judgment in the house of God, the city set upon a hill being shaken, as was Jerusalem. It is our time. So the warning of the book of Hebrews and the encouragement of the book of Hebrews is specific. July the 4th, 10 days ago, um, I found myself in an experience. Now, I'm perhaps in many ways ignorant. Um, But I'm watching the Grand Prix auto race go on. I don't know the history of that. You may know the history of the Grand Prix. I don't know the history of the Grand Prix. I had to study it after I watched what was going on. So in the, um, in the experience, I'm watching the Grand Prix auto race taking place there in Europe. And um, there's this one automobile that is, has the French flag that is leading the way. Now, the competitors for influence, and I mean uh, governmental power and influence, the contenders, the main contenders were Germany, England, go figure, right? Italy, Spain, Greece, few others, but those were the ones in the front of the pack. And the French car, there were actually two of them. There's imagery in this. I don't know how much to go into all this, but there were two French cars. One was in front of the other. There were four German cars. We're talking about people running for governmental positions. Same thing with England. Ireland and Scotland and Wales weren't in the race. Germany was in the race. Italy was in the race with multiple cars, multiple possibilities of leaders. But anyway, how many knew that the Grand Prix started in France? I didn't know. I had to go research it. Why would God use the Grand Prix to show me what he was showing me? There's a lot of other details about the race itself, but uh, they pass through there, which is not what they do, but they pass through there in, in uh, Paris. I watched it. There's uh, in that center place with 12 roads radiating from it. It has a name. There's a, do what? Yes. Thank you, Gail. <laughs> they, they have this one, I guess it's made out of concrete, right? Um, it, it's, there's tombs actually underneath it, so they don't ever go through it. You know, it's like 140 feet wide. 
Uh, but it's a passage underneath. There's people buried there. It's like a tomb to unknown soldiers or something like that. Is that right, Gail? Yeah, several different things. But this French car came right through it, which would be unparalleled. World War II, I know this, when the Allies marched into Paris, they had a parade, French troops leading the way. They came around that structure. They didn't go through it in honor of the dead. I have that on film footage, documentaries. Anyway, what's your point, Terry? Here's the point. Came right through that. And straight to Macron, he won. I'm convinced the fatal wound to the head is a governmental falling of Macron and then his revival. It's in keeping with the truth of what is represented in the heads and the horns, right, Walter? In the book of Revelation and in Daniel. The horns and the heads represent governmental entities. And one head wounded unto death, but is miraculously, let's say it this way, resurrected, is a political fall, a governmental fall, and then coming back in greater power than ever. I'm saying to you that Macron is going to win. Even if he loses, he's still going to win. He's going to return to power. If he's fully taken out, I don't know that he will be, but if he is, he will return to power and more powerful. I was told after that experience that Macron now is seeking what he lacks. He knows his lack. And he is presently seeking spiritual power and is going through the rituals to obtain it. Because he knows without spiritual power, he cannot win. He cannot win. It will be given to him, allowed by the Lord. That is the time we're in. Well, the book of Hebrews. <laughs> There's no way, no good way to transition, Nikki. <laughs> What do you do? Here we are. But again, Hebrews, this masterpiece letter, right, is this uh, beautiful epistle and what we call chapters, right? Each one of them uh, pointing to readiness, positively and negatively. There is that readiness according to Christ versus being drawn away from the person back to our own souls. Right? Hello? You there? So uh, we're going to look at several passages of Scripture. Um, but I want to firstly um, look at... Um, what I started last night as well, I wanted to do this each night. I stopped on chapter four in the overview of Hebrews. So I'm looking at the entire book. It's what the Lord gave me back months ago. I'm looking at the entire book of Hebrews and its message to them and to us. They were living in the time of what Jesus said in Luke chapter 19. What's, he describes what's going to go on, right guys? Is that right? He, just, he tells them ahead of time, and those who were with him heard it clearly, what's going to happen to the city of Jerusalem, the city that they would say the city of God. This is certainly is what happened to Babylon. And by the way, that watcher angel was there with him when he went to uh, Sodom, Gomorrah, where Lot lived. He was there too. He's been with the Lord in a number of biblical places, I could name now that I know. I didn't know that before. So the Lord has him with him. 
the Lord comes down, so to speak. That's the point. And that's a timing issue and a pronouncement of time. It is time for your shaking. I will shake. Right? We're in that time. You know what, Miles? We are in that time. It has actually begun. It's only going to increase. So chapter 5, the book of Hebrews, this is overview. Christ is the one source of eternal, forever salvation to all who obey him. No more daily or yearly sacrifices. All of the outward, all of the temporal is now removed. It is of no use and no need. All of that former religion given to Moses because of unbelief or the law would have never been given, right? Clear teaching of Paul in the New Testament. The law was given because of unbelief. Enoch didn't need it, nor did Abraham. They had relationship with the Lord. And Satan wasn't able to twist the law and its soulish outward things and make it the focus. They just had the Lord. Shouldn't be able to twist the church and make it the focus. Meeting-based Christianity. If we know the Lord. Hello? When that becomes the case in a predominant way, that angel will come, as he did, in the divine moment called now, right in this meeting, for us. Wherever else he's going, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I know this, he stood in our midst and said a number of things that I'm not telling. <laughs> Actually, he went around the room calling everybody out and telling me things. No, he did not. <laughs> it was all positive except for the negative. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. <laughs> Just want to make sure you're still awake back there. What do you say about me, Terry? You don't want to know. <laughs> he told me, and I didn't want to hear it. <laughs> I didn't want to hear it about myself, particularly. <laughs> you sure you got the right person? <laughs> anyway, so uh, the point is they're to grow inwardly there in chapter 5 past milk and the need for it. <laughs> yes, Lord. <laughs> Just glad it wasn't me. <laughs> it could have been. <laughs> I hadn't had my milk yet. <laughs> Child's got to be a prophet. <laughs> what do you think, Nikki? What do you think, Deborah? <laughs> Out of the mouths of babes. <laughs> there it was. <laughs> Grow past milk. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> and the need for it, that we should, according to Hebrews 5, already have been past that. That's what's actually said. You should have already been teachers by this time. In other words, what's being spoken of there, not what's called biblical teachers in the sense of that's Christ the teacher coming through them. That's not what is being addressed. We should have the testimony of the Lord in us in a reality to where we can talk about that reality of Christ. Example it and talk about it clearly without confusion, right? That should have been where they were, right, Chris? They were not there, and you want to know why they were not there? Because the soul and spirit had not been divided, Sam. 
And they were still infants because the soul and spirit had not been divided yet. And outward things still meant something to them. And they were being led astray by the need for outward things. That was they were going backwards into this outward things had meaning. It happened to be Judaism or the former covenant. And it had meaning for them suddenly again. And this is true with the church. We need this in the church. I say that we don't. And the book of Hebrews will back me up in it. That he gave us Christ, not a way of doing church. You know why there's no way of doing church in the New Testament? Because what happens if what we do can't be done in China? Sucks for them. Right? Y'all don't use that word suck? <laughs> Babies do it all the time for milk. <laughs> what do you think about that, Scott? <laughs> Kathy? <laughs> right? See the uh, consistency of Hebrews? And not seeing the book of Hebrews isolated and separated into chapters alone, but seeing its consistency of message, how important it is that is being built, chapter four we call it, but before that to chapter five, which I'm talking about, there's no chapters. What's being stated about them needing milk is because of the lack of the division of soul and spirit. They are needing the outward things in religion to satisfy them. And that's where the church has become that very thing. See how the book speaks? See how this letter speaks to us? The call is back to the person. So Terry, are you saying we shouldn't be doing anything? I'm saying that nothing's the source but Christ. Hear me clearly. And if it's not coming out of the source, yes. It is not something, listen, I, only Christ by the Spirit is our help. And if we're still not finding what we're looking for, it's because soul and spirit has not been divided. And we have not come to the absoluteness of the person of Christ within us as the life, the living way. Right? A new creation. Is that not right, Tony? And like you said, well, we can know it, but is there reality? Is it being applied by the Holy Spirit within us? Isn't that right, John? It's so true. That's the question that I must ask God about. Lord, are you having your way in me? Or do you do it for me? And I have no need of the things of God even. God's jealousy, right, Josiah? God's jealousy is in this. He will not suffer another rival, including the church. He will not suffer, as this book shows, the rival of Judaism. He will raise it to the ground before he sees a rival come forth against him. And he did. He did, Jerusalem. And he's going to the church. Well, take a deep breath. <laughs> Did you take a deep breath? <laughs> so, we should be already past that, Hebrews 5. Already past it. But we're still clinging to the worthless things. Still trying to breathe life into dead things. Isn't that something? God says there's no life. Christ isn't in it. He's the life. He's not in it. But like Abraham pleading with God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Forget it, Abraham. That's not the promised son, Isaac, who you couldn't produce and your wife couldn't produce. And it was a miracle, right? She was past menopause. Her womb was dead. 
God proving to them both, you can't produce the son. And there's nothing you can do to aid the son. Do we get that? That's why the promise of God comes to the barren woman. Your children shall be more than the other. You understand what he's saying? We can't produce. But that we have produced Christianity and that we have produced the church is an abomination to God. We have rejected the Son. We have rejected the Spirit of God, the Spirit of grace, because he's not giving grace for us to disobey God and go after these outward earthly things. He will suffer no rivals. I tell you, he will raise Christianity to the ground. And Satan's after the same thing to totally deceive and bring us into the worthless things. Glorify them and say, oh, but this is God. Nothing ever dies outwardly because Satan keeps bringing it back up to the people of God. We can't move past it because Satan keeps bringing it up. This generation and the next generation, oh, you need this. And we can't see it. We can't understand what's happening. That Lucifer is behind creating the rival. Judaism would rival the Messiah and he was empowering the rivalry. Oh, there's still truth in this, still truth. You still need this Old Testament. You st- don't misunderstand what I'm saying. The 39 books are pointing to Christ. Get to Christ. And you can preach Christ out of the 39 books. Just I and others do it all the time. Chris, don't we? That's not what I'm saying. Don't misconstrue what I'm saying. I'm saying this, that the law given to Moses is no longer needed if you have Christ and the law of Christ called life. I'm saying there's better to have him in us than a law telling us what to do but cannot empower us to live it. I'm quoting actually the scriptures there, right? See how Satan has grabbed hold of Judaism to bring it back to life. He's breathing into Judaism even in the modern times. There's life here, there's need here. You need this, nonsense. It's all nonsense to God. He has given us his son. He happens to be Jehovah. He happens to be the I am. Amen. This one we have living in us is no small fry. Is that what we say? (laughs) You ever ever order the small fries, by the way, Eugene? I never. I always supersize it. (laughs) Why is there a supersize if you can't have it? I think abundance is real and needed, don't you, brother? Abundance, especially the curly fries at Arby's. (laughs) I know, Melanie, pitiful, pitiful, (laughs) and good. (laughs) Yes, amen. Thank you, Melanie, amen. So uh, that's just chapter five. Such people that cannot discern the difference between soul and spirit, Christ and then everything else, are open to the delusion of the second Thessalonians. When God will turn them over to strong delusion because they believe Satan's lie. Isn't that right, Adam? That there's life in something other than Christ. See, we're looking for some big bad man to come up and You know, grab, try to grab hold of us and I'm gonna make you. No, no, it's way, way. The serpent was more subtle. Genesis, right, than that, right? Of all the creatures, he was more subtle than all of them. And it's in the subtlety that people are deceived. Well, there's nothing wrong. I remember, I won't go down that path, but I've had confrontations even publicly with people asking those kinds of questions. Are you saying that shouldn't we be doing these things of the Old Testament? Shouldn't we be? Josiah was with me. 
This is in the great state of Ohio. And uh, <clears throat> Josiah and I were, uh, well, I guess I could describe it this way. <laughs> we were the iceberg that sunk the Titanic. <laughs> So because of that kind of questioning, shouldn't we be doing the nonsense of such stuff? That's not the question. Is Christ not enough whom the Father has given? Do we really think we've exhausted the knowing of Christ? Have you, Tony? I haven't. I'm not even close. I've wondered often, Ellie, if I've even begun. <laughs> and if I have, it's the beginning of the beginning. Now you think, guys, isn't he that magnificent? The only reason we would think we need more is because we don't know him in abundance of life. Because if you're in abundance of the life of Christ inwardly, heaven and no other outward thing means anything to you. God create, could create how many heavens and none of them are gonna satisfy you because you've been satisfied with the person of life. You eat and drink of him. How many can say amen to that? Heaven's not your reward. You have your reward inside of you. And he said it to the priesthood and the Levites, right? I will be, said it to Abraham as well. I will be your exceeding great reward. That was the promise to Abraham, the promise to the priesthood, right? Promise to the Levites there in Numbers chapter three, which correlates with Malachi chapter three. You want to see the, the work again in Malachi chapter three, correlated to Numbers chapter three. That's, it's the same imagery, it's the same wording, it's the same everything. It's the calling of the Levites. Because I saved the firstborn of Israel, the Levites are mine, says the Lord. Listen to that, they are mine, Malachi three. Then those who feared the Lord, right? Spoke to one another. The book of remembrance was written about them. They shall be mine, declares the Lord. That's number three in the Levites. They shall be mine. When I make up my treasured ones, Malachi 3, it's exactly what the Lord has in the Levites. Malachi chapter three, shall purify, like a refiner's fire and a launderer's soap, shall purify the sons of Levi. Is that not what it says, Tony? Numbers three. So God is doing that now, is he not? Malachi 3 is in operation. Numbers 3 is in operation. There is a new order called Christ, the high priest and his priesthood. And they're not confused about any outward thing nor the need for it. Right? They are living testimonies to the person. And they may not know all the details of the past, but they know the person. And what they know of the details of the past is that it points to the reality that it does not carry that's in the person. They know. Amen. And which one do we choose? Know the Lord because you've been called to him and nothing else. You are his or you're not. Isn't that right, Walter? God the Father said that to me. 2021, from the throne, you are mine. Quoting Malachi chapter three directly to me. I said back to him, inwardly though, Walter, nothing external. That's all I've ever wanted to be is yours. Let him touch us right there, right now. That's all I've ever wanted to be. In your own heart, isn't that all you ever wanted to be is his? That's what he has to say to us. I choose you. <laughs> Amen. Beautiful, huh? Well, that's more than the book of Hebrews, but it's in there somewhere. <laughs> so Hebrews chapter five then, and coming into chapter six. Chapter six, let us leave kindergarten school. Let us leave elementary school, right? Elementary school's teachings. Did you catch it? Elementary school's teachings. and press into Christ. And 
go inward and onward to inward possession, thus maturity. And those who will not do so will be prone. It makes clear there, chapter six, to, isn't this right, brother? Falling away. I can't remember his name, Chris. Mike, yes, Mike. So what you said to me earlier, without knowing, it's this, well, who are those that are, were formerly his who are prone to falling away? Those who won't come out of elementary school, that's who. That's what Hebrews has to say. What do you think about that, guys? That's interpreting it rightly because they're still in their souls. Hebrews 4. And soul and spirit's not been divided. And because it's not divided, they're still in elementary school. That's chapter 5. And because they're still in elementary school, chapter 6, they're prone to falling away. What is falling away? Going back to the useless things of the soul. And it's happening all around us, is it not, as we speak. What do you think, Enoch? The church has become not the church of the firstborn any longer, but the church of the living dead. Zombies <laughs> following after nonsense. Because I said it well, quoting the scriptures. Whitewashed sepulchers look pretty on the outside, full of dead men's bones, full of death inwardly. Death is the soul in religion, giving us outward things for us to feel good. It's all about the five senses, right? Christ who gave us those five senses is superior to the five senses. And spirit should be superior to soul. Anybody want to argue that point? I don't think so. God's will is to conquer our soul, not nurture it and make it better. He is not feeding our soul. We are to eat of him as true food and drink, spirit to spirit. Do you all hear what is being said in Hebrews? And to not progress beyond chapter four in the dividing of soul and spirit is to face the reality of being in elementary school and staying in kindergarten. And when I was a child, I spake like a child. I acted like a child. But when I became a man, I put away the soulish things. Let's interpret it rightly for a chance. And if you don't, in chapter six, you stay in kindergarten and you're going to fall. You're going to be easily deluded, easily deceived. Isn't that right, Rick? Easily led astray from the new and living way. Because your soul is restless. Let me repeat that for a moment. Let's uncover it, okay? The soul is restless. Still haven't found what I'm looking for. The soul is restless. It lacks depth of relationship with Christ. And so it seeks in the natural its answer because the soul relates to the natural, not to the spiritual. It was created to relate, by God, to relate to the natural. In divine order, it'll bring Christ in the spirit of man through the soul to the natural. But out of order, the soul in charge, which was what was offered to Eve and she fell for it. And now like Eve, the church as well has fallen for that wrong tree. And led by her soul, she is restless. What's the next new thing? Well, how about the eternal one and his name is Jesus? Just to think, y'all came all this distance to hear this. <laughs> so what does it mean to be stuck in the ditch of elementary school? What does it mean to be stuck in the ditch of kindergarten? Individually, listen. Are you listening? What does it mean to be stuck in the ditch of kindergarten individually and corporately? Both are happening. It means that our minds are not filled with Christ. 
but false, like children, immature concepts, thoughts, reasonings, beliefs, and doctrines that are true in the minds of elementary school, the beginning. Do you hear what I'm saying? Elementary school is the beginning. If we don't get past the beginning, and how do you get past the beginning? You must be trained by discipline beyond the beginning. Relationally speaking, internal discipline is Christ in his cross work of maturity. We need a graduation from elementary school desperately. How many will agree with me? How many wanted to stay in elementary school when you were in there? How many will say that your small children don't think like adults in their reasonings and their concepts, right? So graduation times, Hebrews chapter six, right? Let's look at it, Hebrews chapter six. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings. Let us leave elementary school about Christ and go on. That's called graduation, go on to the maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works. This correlates to the soul again. Correlates to the old covenant. Correlates to Judaism, dead works. And now it's become as true in the church as it was back then. In fact, we've got the mixture. And Satan's in the mixture, is he not? Hello? Right, we need a better response than that, even if you don't mean it. <laughs> what do you think, Lee? <laughs> I need to mean it, don't you think, guys? We need to graduate from such nonsense. God calls it nonsense. That's what it is. There's one source, and it's Christ. And how about coming into the school of Christ, the school of the Spirit? I've been to those before. All of them were elementary schools. <laughs> Sorry, including the one I did. <laughs> That's supposed to be funny. Y'all got your poker faces on, so I can't tell what's going on. <laughs> I, can't, I can't tell what's in your cards. <laughs> well, graduation time is a must, Hebrews 6, 1. Let us leave elementary school and let us go on. Is that not right? Let us go on. That's graduation. Let us leave and let us go on to maturity. That's graduation. That's the Lord filling us from within by his spirit past the childishness, childish ways of thinking. Becoming like a child, it's the simplicity of trust, but not staying childish. Right? It's a very real dynamic that we people, we the people of God, we can grow larger physically, rather quickly, by the way. <laughs> Sometimes after every meal. <laughs> Especially if it's a, as I saw a picture of the other day, this is too good to pass up, Scott. Saw a picture of the other day if you're eating a banana split. <laughs> That'll make you grow. <laughs> Got to joke around with you, brother. <laughs> Actually, I was thinking when I saw it, I was jealous. <laughs> I was thinking, when can I get there to Sweet Teas and White Bluff and get me a banana split? I didn't even know they made them. But I do now. The forerunner Scott has, has made me to know. Sweet Teas does banana splits. And if you don't like the bananas, just bananaless split. <laughs> so we can grow rather quickly 
physically, individually, yes, but I'm, what about corporately? We can grow rather, I'm not talking about numbers. I'm talking about what we do and what the soul can invent. as a substitute for inward reality for Christ, with Christ. You think, if you're sitting there thinking, Terry's just against any outward thing, that would not be true. But if it's a source, I and God are absolutely against it. Can you hear the difference in what I just said? And some people, oh, that's my way out. I can have that. Not if it's a source. You're not dealing with me. You're going to have to deal with God. And, and please hear what I'm saying from the book of Hebrews. And if you need it, you're shakable. And he, God, will shake you. And any congregation of people in need of the outward. When that angel, that watcher, watchman angel was standing there, guess what he was looking for? An unshakable people. I want that, don't you, Chris? I know you do, brother. I want that, don't you, Josiah? Everyone in this room. We're going to get the Lord if we want him. Don't you think, Sam? We're gonna get him, aren't we, Mike? Or are we going to get something else, Lee, right? Something else. Don't you think, Brenda? Don't you think, Gail? We're gonna get the Lord we want, Maritza, Herb and Mary, great to see you. <laughs> We're gonna get the Lord we want as our life and as our all in all. Or we're going to get something else we want. Our souls will produce it. We'll make it a source for people. This will really help the people. I disagree. A thousand percent. This thing has been a crutch too many times for it to be safe in the hands of elementary students. So we can grow outwardly physically, and never do any growing inwardly. Reminds me of a John Wayne movie <laughs> called Shepherd of the Hills. Anybody ever seen it? Remember Shepherd of the Hills? It wasn't about Jesus, it was about John Wayne. It wasn't about JC, it was about JW. <laughs> that last name's important. <laughs> Anyway, the whole moral of the movie comes back down to the very end when he's wanted to kill his father all his life because he thinks that his father abandoned his mother and he did not know that his father had killed a man and gone to prison and he had no concept of that. And then there at the end, he's going to go kill his father and his father shoots him first. And he survives it and then here's the story about his father going to prison and his father stopping him from killing him because his father knew he too would go to prison. Anyway, that's not all important. Here's what John Wayne says in the movie. Ever since I was little, I've been outgrowing my britches. You know how John Wayne is. You know? <laughs> did all this growing outwardly, but I never did any growing up inwardly. That's what happens when the soul becomes the highlight of the church. That's Hebrews 4. So, time's flying by. Hebrews 5, I'm going to read this even more. Hebrews 5, 11, and then coming into 6. We have a great deal to say about this. I'm trying to say a great deal about it. it. may be pitiful, but nevertheless. And it is difficult to explain since you have become too lazy to understand. <laughs> we have lazy, love, man-centered, lazy life, man's life, lazy grace, 
lazy, just about everything. That's not the will of God, right? Where's the positive in this message? Jesus, just like in the book of Hebrew. You're like, man, Terry, it sounds so negative. I'm positive that we're on negative ground or we wouldn't be in this predicament. <laughs> I'm positive that we have missed the will of God and that we've misappropriated the grace of God and that if we're not careful, we're gonna find ourselves like Judaism being shaken by our God. And thus I speak right from these scriptures, the warning and the encouragement. I do not neglect the warning. It is at least equal to the encouragement in this book. But it depends on our souls versus our spirit as to what we hear, what we are able to hear, and what we can receive. And if you're just in your soul, you hear only the negative. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. But if Christ is your life, you hear the encouragement of stand fast, hold steady. Right? You know what Moses said? Stand fast to the elementary children that come out of Egypt. Stand fast. You'll see the salvation of God. Isn't that right, guys? There's no way to pe preach only one side of this when we stand on such a shakable ground. Because only Christ is the unshakable ground. We stand on soulish ground that is easily shaken. Isn't that right, Chris? You know, it is right. Sorry to say it, but it is what it is. And uh, guys, I'm, not, uh, I'm a realist. I'm not an optimist. And I'm not a pessimist. I'm a realist. I've traveled amongst the church enough to know the reality of this. The battle for life that we are in, right? Christ is life. And everything pitted against that life. Every soulish thing and every principality pitted against that and the message of life. And in that battle with principalities, it cannot be, hear me, cannot be met by soulish things. Outward things won't defeat them. It'll only make them more powerful against us. They cannot be defeated by what the church is doing. Well, this thing here, praise will bring them down. Fooey, fooey, fooey. You're crazy to believe it. Life must counter. The Christ of life in the church must counter the principalities. It's hard to say it that way, but in the Old Testament, we're not in it, are we? We happen to be in Christ. And the greatest battle is now, not back then. And the antagonism of the principalities is to get our eyes off the person and on to praise or whatever. That's the key in the answer, nonsense. I'm sorry to be so intense about this, but we're losing the fight because of such nonsense. They are affected by the living Christ and they can scan us and you immediately and tell what's the measure of life. Paul I know, Jesus I know, but who in the world are you? Right? So uh, guys, if we're going to meet them and heavenly ground, then it's going to be Christ. And if we meet them on soulish or earthly ground, we are already defeated. And I've not seen too many principalities pulled down, despite what's being said by people. There's a fantasy world about this. We pulled this principality down. Really? Did crime stop? Very practical, huh? People stop killing. People start, stop stealing. We're kidding ourselves. Did the church wake up? <laughs> what principality do we think we've pulled down? 
or he pulled down Leviathan. <laughs> I'm sorry, I gotta laugh. See, if, Leviathan makes, if Leviathan makes himself known and Christ is not there, we're toast. But they're not trying to destroy what they already have. I said it before, Satan is using the church as he used Judaism. He has twisted the church just like Judaism and is using that very entity against the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you think? Do you think we should repent? Repentance alone isn't going to, uh, let's say it this way, even forgiveness alone is not the same as repentance. Repentance is going to involve coming back to the Lord, seeing the Lord, knowing the Lord, being filled and possessed by the Lord. That's a true repentance. Right? Don't you think, guys? We can get forgiven all day long, but we won't be delivered. And we'll do the same thing over and over again because that's what's in us. Anyway, so kindergarten school is just the beginning. And even movements that are from God are notorious for never moving past their beginnings. Kindergarten school rules. Kindergarten school rocks. Kindergarten school, elementary school is to be desired. The soul is the best. <laughs> what do you think, Minnie? Maybe you never heard it said quite that way, but is there a good way to say it, Gina? I don't know one. I mean, Michelle? I'll get the name right here in a moment. Sabrina? Lori? Is there a good way to say it? Went to this meeting and man, their worship rocked. What's that mean? You mean they had a rock and roll band up there? Nashville's filled with that. And musicians right from the stardom to attract the people. And that's where we're at. God's going to shake. People standing in the pulpits have never been born again or they've never gone past the beginning. Right? So let me press on here. <laughs> so like a book, book of Hebrews. It's the fact. There is the fact of this individually and corporately going on to where kindergarten and elementary school that beginning is where we are stuck individually and corporately. God begins something and we are children still in our thinking that this must endure. Children think that way because they're children. When I was a child, I... Guess what? I thought like a child. What are you saying, Terry? I'm saying sonship, maturity, discipleship is not what's going on. That's what I'm saying. That's not what's going on in the corporate. Christ is not the subject, the life, the truth. We are ministering to the needs of people, but Christ is absent. So we're ministering to the souls of people. You're depressed. I need to get you out of that depression. There's no such thing as a dark night of the soul if you're in the right relationship with Jesus Christ. And I don't care what book was written. <laughs> and I know what books are written. I disagree. Christ himself never had a dark night of the soul. Paul never had a dark night of the soul. You have a dark night of the soul if your soul is raining. Thank you, Sam. 
Do I see a head? <laughs> Thank you, Sam. It's the, it's the facts of it. I have never gone through a dark night of the soul and don't plan on it, though I've gone through many a pain. Right? So, but I do not equate going through pain and suffering as a dark night of the soul. The Lord was in me the entire time. It is only in my soul that says, where, I tell the story of myself, but where are you? Where are you? The Lord comes with a voice from inside. Here I am. <laughs> we used to joke around about this years ago. Where are you, Lord? I'm in here. <laughs> okay. Even if you feel estranged, even if you feel distant, you know what, Jim? Even if you and Jessica feel estranged and feel distant and feel like this battle is going to overwhelm, and will we ever survive? And can we ever come to rest? Sound like Hebrews 3 and 4, right? Even if you are stumbling, you think, in the darkness. You think that. That's your soul talking to you. It's a faulty computer that can't read spiritual dynamics. It can only read the natural, and that means it will misread God every single time. The soul doesn't know what God's doing. And those who don't know what God is doing, I can tell you easily what God is doing. He's working in us. <laughs> that sounds comical, but it's true. He's much more concerned about that inward work of conformity to Christ than he is through us. He can come through a donkey. <laughs> Maybe easier than me. What do you think, Eugene? <laughs> and many a day I wanted to go out into the field and pray. <laughs> I don't have a complex about it. I don't have a, I don't have a complex about that. <laughs> I've got to laugh. <laughs> it may be soulish, but I'm going to laugh anyway. <laughs> I'm going to laugh at my own soul, my own foolishness. Been there, done that, got the T-shirt for it. Felt like God was nowhere to be found. He left me, even though he said he wouldn't. That don't mean anything. The faith we once had, which shows where it comes from, not God but us, <laughs> the faith we once had goes out the window in suffering and trying times. Hebrews 11. <laughs> faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And we're going to have a fight of faith on our hands in this time of shaking that we are in. And we're either going to believe God that it is God himself, hear me, that it is God himself who began a good work in me, and though I don't fully understand it, Walter, and I can't fully see all that he's doing, I believe him nonetheless. And that he who began a good work in me, that he, not me, is able to complete it if I can trust him. Is that not true? Is that not the fact of this thing? It's going to be a fight on our hands of faith. Do we believe in him who has begun the work? Do we believe that he is still working? And though maybe I can't see it, nevertheless, the Spirit of God is working within me. Just God, help me not to resist you. And so it's not, listen, it's gonna be a fight of faith. Did he do for us what he did or didn't he? Did he become the author of salvation for us or didn't he? Has he brought us into a place where he's killing the old man, killing religion, putting to death soulless religion, and when he puts to death what we've had for years and done for years, yes, it's uncomfortable. <laughs> and you can feel worthless. But let me encourage you, you were worthless while you were doing it. <laughs> What an encouragement. What do you think about that, Lisa? <laughs> Somebody shut him up. <laughs> no wonder we've been under such battle. Dr. Sly and I were talking about it earlier today. He's, he's talking about Ben. Since Ben's not here, we've got to throw Ben under the truck. So They've got a reason for not being here. It's called a wedding. <laughs> 
And they're on vacation. They're out in the mountains hiking. I said to Josiah, while wow, the devil's stomping on our heads. <laughs> they're out hiking. <laughs> Got to tell Ben that when he gets back. Let Heather beat him up a little bit. <laughs> so, guys, again, it's why we were in this, and God takes it from us because he's moving us out of elementary school. He's wanting us to graduate in our understanding. Your usefulness is not by your gift. Being a vessel is to manifest, manifest the Christ and his life by example. That's true usefulness. God can do anything through us anytime if we'll go right there with him relationally. And when those things are not happening, what does it mean? Nothing. He's not using me like he used to use me. You mean when you used to try to use him to do what you wanted? <laughs> make, like make a name for yourself. No, I'm not, sorry. <laughs> when you used to be seen, when you used to have notoriety. So... <clears throat> We must not remain children in our thinking. Children think the way they do because they're children, because they're only at the beginning. They're just starting their journeys. They must grow inwardly, not just outwardly. The church corporately has grown outwardly, but has it grown inwardly? What do you think, Chris? I got the question to all of us. You tell me. Has not the church grown outwardly, but has it grown inwardly? Because the one who makes it grow by his spirit has become small at best when he isn't, but he's become that to us. And so loving our toys like children our soulish substitutes for spiritual reality, toys. Playing our games that we love to play. Living in our imaginary friend. Cuddling our teddy bear. That's how fragile we are. So they act in ways that are cute because they're children. But not when you're an adult. Not when your body's full grown and inwardly, spiritually, you're still acting that way. When I was a child, I acted like a child. I thought like a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. God's into maturity not babysitting forever. The Spirit has not been given to us to babysit us. Is that not right? He's the helper, not the babysitter. <laughs> He's called the Spirit of Christ. He gives us Christ, points us to Christ, brings in Christ, inwardly, outwardly, both. That's his work. The church has become elementary school, kindergarten, and for the parents' sake, a babysitting place as well. Children must be trained, is that not right? For there to become discipleships. They must grow up, they must learn better. And they cannot remain in their present, with their present concepts, their present understandings, their present beliefs, nor acting from them. I'm almost done, which doesn't mean anything, but I thought I'd say that. <laughs> Might be meaning when you cut me that snake that steak that night. <laughs> or now, who is ever going to do it? Whatever you're going to cook me. Probably now, roasted buzzard. <laughs> 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 uh, 
This is also a fact of the corporate, where God begins and where man's system has also begun. Which beginning did we have? Which beginning did we have corporately? Did we have God's beginning, Mike? Or did we have the churches? Did we have tradition? Whose beginning did we have? Was it by his spirit or was it by tradition? Is our concepts been molded around our traditions? And can God shake us loose from them and make us to realize he gave his son to be life? I have come that you might have life and you may have it more abundantly. And he's talking about inward, not outward, because the outward doesn't affect the inward. The inward affects the outward. That's just Bible. That's just the Bible, right? So what has come of the corporate is we've had man's beginning. Can we shake loose from what we have known, what we have experienced? Can we get free from it? Can we get back to the simplicity of Christ himself? Or will we too remain in elementary school? What is the consequence of a corporate gathering if they remain immature? Immature in that they're giving out in their example? They're giving out in their counsel. They're giving out in their teaching. They're giving out in their churching life, church life. They're giving out in expression. They're giving out direction. They're giving out planning. They're giving out vision. They're giving out procedures. And they're giving out training that is completely and utterly immature at best. What is the consequence of that? The result is not discipleship. The result is not sonship. The result is not cross life. The result is not divine representation here and now. The result is not full measure of Christ within. The result is not his testimony. The result is not the maturing from children to saints. Is not uh, the unity of the spirit nor the bond of peace. Ponder that for a moment. And correlate it with the division instead of unity with God. Division with God, I mean. Of course, there's division with one another when there's division with the Godhead. When we're still in our independent spirit, when we're still in immaturity, we're in division with God. We don't have his vision. We have two visions called division. There is no two visions. There's God's eternal vision in Christ. And if we're not reckoned inwardly by that life, his vision of Christ, the all in all of the entire universe, not just us, Hebrews 4, he must fill the entire universe. If we are out of that vision and is only in Christ, do you hear that? Only in Christ again, then we are divided. We are in division with the Godhead. We're in division with the angelic order. and They will not support us. They cannot. They answer to Christ, not us. If the corporate gathering is immature, then there's no conformity to Christ. There's no transformation to his image and likeness. There's not a bride being made ready. There's no divine readiness at all. There's not a church for which he died and that he loves. Instead, we give out what we are. And generation after generation after generation, this has been true. We are propagating immaturity. We are propagating the soul. The soul can't be divided. We have a language for it, and because now it's the majority They have the power, and they have the money, and they have the voice of the people to the people. Though God is merciful, and he can get through to a few, 
who are willing to listen beyond what they are hearing and have heard. Right, Enoch? Can we hear beyond what we've been hearing? Do we have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church? Hear beyond what we've been hearing and what we've heard? That's the problem with the prophetic movement. Man, I heard this new thing. What might that be? Because it's called immaturity. There's this new thing God's doing. Yeah, the new thing's an old thing, and his name is Jesus. The new thing was promised in the Old Testament, not the new. <laughs> you go back and look at it in Isaiah. The new thing is a promise of Christ. But we twist it just like Satan did. Is that not right, Tony? Isn't that right, Chris? We twist these scriptures. They're not talking about Jesus. They're talking about something else. Behold, I will do a new thing, we say. We need a new thing. We need Jesus. That's the fulfillment of those scriptures. <laughs> what do you think, Ellie? Somebody shut him up. No, I won't shut up. I'm not going to shut up. Christ is worth the cost, if there's going to be a cost, don't you think? He must have what he is worthy of, a bride made ready. And this is a fight for readiness, and the shaking is upon us, and the warning is coming again from God. I didn't expect it, but the angel has been sent in correlation with the message this weekend. God's stamp. Yes. Prepare. Inwardly speaking, be readied by the Lord within us because the shaking is at hand. Everything that can be shaken, heavenly and the earthly, will be shaken so that only Christ remains afterwards. And he's coming at the end of it to prove that point. Is he not? Now, I hope you're not sleeping through this message. <laughs> oh, what a sense of poor humor. God can steal in the midst of the systems that you, if you're going on with the Lord, will have to come out of. It's not that he doesn't have any of his people in those systems. He's just trying to get them out of it by getting them to him. Not get out and start a new system, just as bad as the former of the soul. Can you hear that? See, when Acts, or just I was hitting, when Acts becomes a way of doing church, we're in our soul. We're going to copy everything in the book of Acts. Copy what? You can't copy the power of Christ within in transformation. You can only experience it. I've had people write me letters and to email me, when are you going to stop meeting in the buildings? Don't you know you're supposed to be in the homes? See, we've got another system. God's going to shake your home group too. <laughs> Man, I'm terrible. No more, no less than he shakes any other meeting. You think God thinks the home is more spiritual than this building? The key is getting out of the building. The key is getting out of your soul. <laughs> I've said it many times. What I lack in the fruit of kindness, I make up through the gift of sarcasm. <laughs> what? What? You can't copy. There's no diagram there. There's no schematic. This is what you do to have church. It's a living organized, organism, not an organized affair. We've organized it, but it's a living organism. It's Christ's life being manifested, being shown, being exampled. And listen to what I'm saying. It's not in meetings that matters at all. The best discipleship, the possibility of it begins with the husband and wife unto the children. In the home. Not a meeting in the home. A family. Husband, wife, and children. And while Satan has attacked that 
in order to destroy the house of God because he knows if you have divine order in the home, if you have a man of God who becomes a husband of God, who becomes a father, right? A husband to his wife and a father from God to his children. And if you have a woman of God first, should be what the church is discipling into, who becomes a wife of God, I mean with her husband and him with her, and a mother to the children. The great power of God is in that union to affect those children, right, Gail? In the way they should go. But boy, does Satan attack that, right? And the marriage is under great battle. How many can say amen to that? The home is under great battle. And are we in unity of the spirit and the bond of peace in the home? Husbands, are you leading? According to the scriptures, are you still, as you were the man of God, now the husband and no different, still going after Jesus wholeheartedly and as a father wholeheartedly? And ladies, are we still that as a woman of God and a wife and a mother still going after Jesus and giving of the reality of the person within us, not rules and regulations, but in a relationship that is a growing thing. And you start out as immature parents before you'll ever be mature. But go towards that of Christ within in maturity. Is that not right? Satan is battling those two things, marriage in the home and the church, because they are intricately connected. He knows it better than us. I call all men in this room, if you're a husband, back to being a man of God first. You cannot lead according to the divine plan of God without God, our vision. God, our life. God, our hope. God, our all in all. We're not fit to be husbands and we're not fit to be fathers unless that is foundationally true. Don't get married. Not because you're too young. That may be true, but don't get married until the Lord has settled that path for you in that journey. I'm to be his. And that needs to be proven. Is that not right? Amongst the people of God. Well, that's counsel, but you know. God in his mercy has reached in and snatched me out. Hasn't he you? And man, I don't have it all figured out. I just need Jesus. I just want Jesus. And there are gonna be people out there that are gonna contend with us they're going to argue with us if we let them. Just don't do it. Arguments never settle anything. And they're going to try to take us down and get us into confusion and get us into fear and get us into, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And it's going to be our trust and faith in the person that hangs on tenaciously and goes on, though I don't have to know everything, and nor do they. They only think they do. But what we do know is this person has given himself for me, that I know. This person has begun a good work in me and he is working in me and delivering me from me and he's erasing my former history and bringing in his own history. It is only going to intensify in the shaking. That which God is shaking does not lay over and quit. It becomes more, less, less, more stubborn, more vocal, more angry, and more resistant to God than ever. While Noah was building the ark, the people were mocking, not asking the right questions. Don't expect anything less.
I keep looking at the clock. I got a new watch given to me. It's a Sunday watch. <laughs> watch this on Sunday when you're preaching. <laughs> brings people out who are willing to hear. He invites them to himself and out of elementary school, out of kindergarten, and into the school of Christ. Fight the good fight, my friends, my brothers, my sisters. Fight the good fight. Take hold of the Lord and hang on. It's not that we know everything about him. That'll be an eternity of relationship. Each new age in its beginning, is a release from the Son of a revelation, a fresh revelation of who he is. And it will mark the entire age. So don't get caught up in, well, I gotta know this. I've got to know this. Know the Lord, you do. Believe in him who has sacrificed himself for us all and given himself. Believe in him who's begun a good work in you and recognize its beginning and recognize its progression called discipleship. Recognize it's unto sonship. Recognize the battle. Recognize the conflict of light and dark that is in it. Recognize that when you go out and come out to the Lord and you go into Christ and he comes into you, that is a trigger for battle corporately and individually. It's not a trigger for peace, it's a trigger for war. Satan didn't need to resist us while we were still under his power. He was encouraging us, much like he is presently the church. He's feeding the church lots of money today. That which is most soulish has the most. It is blessed to be poor in spirit. <laughs> you feeling poor lately, Nikki? <laughs> Mighty poor. <laughs> what do you think, Deborah? The checking account is on a continuous slide downward. <laughs> oh well. Just do a lot of fishing and hope for a gold coin. <laughs> <laughs> may the Lord bless your finances I mean that may the Lord multiply your finances I'm not just praying that as a doctrine it had nothing to do with doctrine I'm saying it because of an angel standing right there over you and you're not complaining about the finances but may the Lord bless your finances to complete the mission and continue the mission, maybe a better way to say that, Deborah and Nikki, to continue the mission which God has began in and through you, individually, but also corporately, where it's being so powerfully resisted. You all have done made up your minds individually, but corporately you're being resisted. And a part of that is a financial resistance. So I ask the Lord, now according to this angel standing there, who has a, for some reason, has a... Uh, a balance over top of you. So I guess I could ask what that means <laughs> or not. <laughs> I'm certain of this, though. It means that one side, the lack, is actually outweighing what's there. So, Lord, it's more than make ends meet because it has to be more than that for there to be fulfillment of the mission. Isn't that right? For the mission to be fulfilled, practically speaking, there has to be more than it just balanced out. It's got to be more. So Lord, uh, bring the more. Now I know these guys and I know they're after Jesus or I don't think God would be showing me this and I wouldn't want to say it because if we're in our souls and they're not, if we're in our souls, I'm not asking God to bless it, but they're not. They're in battle because they're not. I know that from them talking with them, knowing them. So now, Lord, bring the supply according to the need to finish the work and for the work to progress. In the making of disciples. 
in the preparation, in the readiness, right? Bring full supply. I ask, Lord, I didn't expect that to happen, but the angel's standing there, so I might as well notice. What you doing over there? <laughs> Never seen you before. Because he's assigned to you guys, right? Let us go on. That's Hebrews 6. And if we don't go on, then it's going to be hard Here it is, Mike. It's going to be hard to get us to repent of staying in or going back to the former thing. Because we're not going to believe we need to repent. I'm looking at Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 4. It's impossible to renew again to repentance those who were once enlightened, who tasted the heavenly gift, that would be Christ and the Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ, who shared in the Holy Spirit, see, who tasted God's good word and the power of the coming age. See, we've not come to something temporal. We've come to the eternal. And who have fallen away. This is that great apostasy, the great falling away. Hebrews warns about because of the shaking of God, of the system, and we're attached to the system. We're in love with the system. We need the system. And you're, I hope we're not sitting here thinking, oh man, I'm not in love with any of that, but we love our toys. And we love our feel good. And we love what we think is needed for us to go on with the Lord and what we think the congregation needs to go on with the Lord and to have the fullness of the Lord with. And we think, we think, we think, and we're in love with what we think. And I'm telling you it's Christ. Josiah's telling you it's Christ. Chris is telling you it's Christ. And I'm gonna ask Josiah and Chris to come up here. Is that okay? Andy, would you come up too, brother? I just thought since the devil's gonna throw darts, might as well be four of us. <laughs> Sam, would you come up too, brother? Stand right in front of me. (laughs) No, I mean it, come up. I'd have Ben to come up, but he's off hiking in the mountains. (laughs) He's not here to respond, so. What am I wanting here? I'll tell you what I'm wanting. I'll tell you what I want. Some of us, and I'm just this as a representative, Some of us are going all the way. Come on up here. Some of us are going to go all the way. I mean, as leaders, we're going to go all the way. And if that's you, I want you to stand up. We're here representing not elementary school. We're here representing not kindergarten. We're here representing a Jesus who is the all in all of God. God does not recognize any help to the church beyond his son by the spirit. Isn't that right, Eugene? You've been in this battle for years, haven't you, brother? I recognize that. Recognize that with Nick, Nikki and Deborah and others in this room. I know that's true. Couldn't have you all up here. Got to preach at somebody out there. No, (laughs) No. we're here to represent something. That's why I want to do it. The Lord showed me to do this. Um, Not just five minutes ago either, Uh, several days ago. We're here standing in front of you and with you now as you stand, saying we're going to stand. There's an unshakable person of life and in a possessing way, corporately. Can you hear that gathering? Corporately. Gathering. Can you hear it? Corporately. People from everywhere are here. Can you hear it? corporately too, not just individually, corporately. Isaac, I want you to come up. I'm sorry. I didn't forget you. I just uh, was afraid of that gun you're carrying. (laughs) I believe in Isaiah 40 for the 40 millimeter I really do damage. (laughs) I don't want Isaiah 40 pointed at me. (laughs) 
the midst of the church world's soulish ground. Again, Hebrews comes forth in a message for our times. God is going to shake down to dust the rival to his son. Let it be so in our hearts so it won't be so in our earthly things. If he has us inwardly, the outward won't be there to shake. We covenant with the true covenant of Jesus Christ to preach him, to proclaim him, to example him, to live him, to not fall into the trap of Hebrews 5 and 6, grow lazy, live in confusion, allow the voices of men or people, better said, to draw us into a paralysis of fear so that we stop going on. We refuse to be paralyzed by the spirit of an accuser. Refuse to live petrified lives because we are attached to the old ancient things, which means you become petrified instead of the new living way, Christ. We refuse to heed as the will of God, the voice of man. There is a covenant called Christ and he is within us. He's worth messengers like Walter back there like Eugene, like Mike, like Tony, like many others in this room, Nikki and Deborah, and I could go around the room, but he's worth our all in all, is he not, guys? He's worth it, Eugene. He's worth the fight, isn't he, Jason? Isn't he, Emily? Isn't he, Alan? Isn't he, Jen? Isn't he, John? Isn't he, Allison? J, 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 A, A, E? <laughs> I was thinking about that. <laughs> What's that spell? Nothing. <laughs> well, that was weird. Speaking anyway. Speaking in tongues. <laughs> That's right. What's he doing? <laughs> we refuse to bow in the fear of man. Refuse to follow the desires of people. The soul's desires, let me say it that way. Instead, we will do exactly as we've been commanded. We've been called, we've been commissioned, we've been appointed to preach Christ, to teach Christ, to give Christ, to live Christ, to let Christ shine, knowing that he alone, the author and perfecter of our faith, the source himself, is the hope of his people of his church, of his bride, and of our times. So say we all here. We say it in front of many witnesses here, including those online. We stand in this hour calling for God's people to come out, come out, come outside the city that is now doomed for destruction. Come outside the city that's going to be shaken. Come outside that system by coming to Christ. Come out to the Lord. Not just out of the system. Come out to the Lord and you'll come out of the system. So say we all. In the name of Jesus. I pray, Lord, for leaders of courage, like Joshua was told, be very courageous. It's gonna take it. Because you got two things to deal with. You got a people who are fearful in your ranks 
And you got giants in a land. Still true. Be full of courage. Don't back down. We speak straight the word of the Lord to our spirit, the spirit of God in our spirit, Christ in our spirit joined to us and the Father. Spirit to spirit, I say, go on in the Lord. Forget what was former. Forget what was behind. Forget the glory days and get to the person of glory. The glory days are a lie. Christ is the glory of God. The past cannot be better than our future if Christ is our future. We bless you, Lord. We say this solemnly before you. We belong to you. We choose to not be our own. We have been bought with a price and we choose to glorify God in our bodies. We are here for you. Let's all say amen. Amen. So be it, Lord. Amen. All right, guys. You may pass out quietly.